It's truly great to be here at ONS and part of this really vibrant and strong open source community as we truly drive all sorts of innovations in a very open way towards network transformation. And when you come to think about it, and you think about our everyday lives, and you think about how we typically do spend some time with technology each and every day, almost everything we do somehow generates data. That could be simple emails, texts, or perhaps watching a video with your family, uploading a video, or even maybe tweeting about this very conference. All of this generates data. But that amount of data truly pales in comparison, or is just a drop in the bucket when you compare it to the amount of data that will be generated from machines, use cases such as autonomous driving as another example. And when I think about data, I truly think about it in a way that, that will give all of us in this room all sorts of opportunity to deliver new economic value. It will also enhance our daily lives. And two of my favorite examples of how you can bring data to life are AI and drones. And through AI and drones, it will definitely enhance our lives, but also change industry. Things such as search and rescue, farming, security, and even entertainment, to name another. And in fact, earlier this year, at the Korean Olympics, Intel broke the Guinness Book of World Record for the largest drone show at the opening ceremony, of course, powered by AI. And this was truly a spectacular show with over 1,200 drones. And then when I take a moment to think about my own life outside of work and what my true passion is, I think about surfing. And I truly enjoy catching and riding waves with my boys. But sometimes, not with my boys, but when I paddle out into what some may deem as spooky waters or perhaps sharky waters, and in those instances, I do my very best to try to not think about an image but sometimes, every once in a while, you think about possibly, just beneath the surface, the man in the gray, gray, oh, excuse me, the man in the gray suit, otherwise known as a great white shark. And again, you try to forget about that. But Intel did innovate and created something called the Movidius neural compute stick. And that, in combination with drones, can provide AI. And in this instance, we partnered with another ecosystem member. And essentially what they did was they developed a drone that could spot and detect sharks before they arrived at areas where people were surfing. So this not only could help save a ton of lives, but it also can make that everyday surf or that everyday life experience so much better. It's these sorts of innovations that will truly change the way we live our lives and also create all sorts of economic opportunities for all of us in this room. So data is truly a, the foundation of the next wave of transformation, really the next wave of technical innovations uh, from things like <clears throat> autonomous driving, AR, VR, cloud gaming, uh, et cetera. And when you think about what we need to do in this room, we need to fuel and inspire the network to be able to support next generation services running on gigabit LT speeds as well as 5G. And when you think about the vast array of 5G use cases, you of course start thinking about how the network truly needs to transform to a network that is far more flexible, far more automated and scalable than the one we have today. And with that underlying characteristics of the network, I do believe we can bring out the best in 5G and exploit that additional broadband capability, exploit machine-to-machine -machine communications. In addition, deliver all sorts of low latency services. But in addition to this, besides making it flexible and scalable, the network also needs to be open to drive and fuel innovation so a whole host of different folks can create efficient virtual network functions as well as new services that will truly deliver amazing experiences to our customers. Now we have been on this path really since the early parts of the decade. In the beginning of this decade, we really focused on moving the industry from fixed function appliances to standard-based computing or commercial off-the-shelf servers. And since then, we've added virtualization to deliver a little bit of flexibility, and we've seen communication service providers start to do deployments. 
Now, since those early days, new architectures and methodologies have truly evolved to help us reach what our end goal is, and that's to really deliver more scale, agility, and flexibility on the network, but also one that's more automated, more secure, as well as service assured. Now with that, there's a ton of hype around new cloud-ready like solutions, and I do believe these will have a very good home in our networks, but these capabilities and technologies need to continue to evolve to ensure we're meeting the needs of comm service providers to be able to hit that, sc that scalability and flexibility, but also meet their underlying SLA requirements. Now, cloud service providers, they have truly harnessed their ability to run and scale applications utilizing their infrastructure. And I do believe that comm service providers can apply many lessons learned that that, that industry went through in adopting these technologies. And I do believe they need to keep both their technical and business goals top of mind when pursuing different architectures. And I do believe that cloud-ready or cloud-native solutions has their place, but I do believe we need to evolve that technology to allow comm service providers to overcome barriers, both operationally, organizationally, as well as technically, to deploy these solutions. And because of this, Intel is truly collaborating with the industry, working with the cloud-native community, working with the Kubernetes team to enable containerized environments that meet network use cases. And in the near term, with this in mind, we do anticipate more virtualized, cloud-friendly, like solutions being deployed in the very near term, and over the longer term, more cloud-ready or more cloud-native type solutions. We are seeing the effect and the impact of network transformation really across the network in both fixed and mobile, in the core, in the access network, and all the way to customer premise equipment. And in the meantime, our customers, consumers and businesses alike, continue to demand new and amazing experiences, some at home and some in the business place. And we all know that comm service providers typically operate under very tight operational capital budget. So it's very challenging to keep up with the current demands, as well as they have the desire and all of us have the need to truly plan for the 5G future. And when you think about 5G with those vast array of use cases, we truly believe the network needs to become more horizontal in nature. We will truly place computes throughout the overall network, and you can think about having many data centers at several points of presence in the network. The end goal, being able to scale virtual network functions truly seamlessly throughout the network to when and wherever you need those network functions to better manage, manage your traffic and deliver the right quality of experience. So when you think about today's network transformation, in the beginning, it is really focused on the centralized core, the wireless core, things like virtual EPC, virtual IMS, just to name a few. However, with the modernization of fixed networks and fixed networks becoming much more fiber rich, the attention of the industry has now shifted towards the edge of the network and a concept called next generation CL. Now in this vision, each central office must be able to support both fixed and mobile communications. It also must be able to support a plethora of devices, data, and a ton of new subscribers. And with this, comm service providers are beginning to see their central office as a strategic point in their network to deliver all sorts of new experiences, 5G use cases, IoT use cases, immersive media, and entertainment. And if you think about immersive media just for a second, you think about the underlying characteristics. It requires very high bandwidth as well as a low latency network. And then you think about a typical CO today, Typical COs don't have the right computes, storage, or flexibility to be able to deal with that workload in an efficient manner and still deliver the right quality of experience. So this portion of the network is truly ripe for transformation, and it will set us up very well by enabling us to have the right speed and nibbleness in the 5G era. So you can think about this NGCO as really a fiber-rich mini data center that could support up to 35,000 subscribers 
as compared to a typical CEO today, which is roughly 5,000 subscribers. In addition to this, it's located between the access network and the metro transport network. And essentially, it is a scaled down version of a data center in a smaller area and smaller footprint. But it still delivers the right amount of computes and flexibility needed to handle those unique cases that service providers are expected to deal with. Now, we are seeing lots of, lots of innovations across different industry standard groups and open source groups alike. We're seeing a lot of effort in terms of putting new innovations into reference architectures to enable VNFs and new applications or services to truly scale at this location edge. And because of this, we're seeing a lot of comm service providers truly eye this portion of the network and look to innovate really around the globe and in all sorts of circumstances, from urban, dense environments to suburban landscapes to even rural COs. And with this, Intel is definitely doing our share. We are working on optimizing the critical workloads such as VBNG and virtual EPC here. And in fact, through the use of DPDK, we were able to achieve roughly 400 gigabits per second on a commercial off-the-shelf server, more than enough to handle these workloads uh, of today. In addition to this, we've also showcased with partners how you can, through an automated network infrastructure, dynamically scale the compute resources up and down in order to ensure you're better managing your traffic as well as better managing your overall TCO. It's these sorts of innovations and these sorts of partnerships that's truly critical to drive network transformation and scale our networks. So now, let's turn our attention to the RAN. And unlike previous generations of wireless, 5G caters and provides the right tools to deliver vertical specific applications or enterprise applications. Furthermore, it provides comm service providers the ability to solve these problems with the right amount of resources, not too much or not too little, kind of like the Goldilocks principle. And one of the use cases you probably heard about is something called a virtual RAN. And a virtual RAN is simply put, it is a general purpose server that can run all baseband functions. And this server would be located at a different spot than the remote radio head. And if you think about some of the cloud service provider business models, and how comm service providers sometimes look at that flexibility in those computes, you can see how virtual RAN would be a great fit. Essentially, it's a composable architecture that you could use for all sorts of deployment scenarios. In addition to this, it can be a, a very good asset for app developers. As app developers truly look to drive innovations in smart retail, smart manufacturing, and smart transportation, they can take advantage of the RAN's proximity to users and its real-time nature and use things such as real-time fine-grained analytics to bring out the best in those use cases. For example, with our Intel FlexRAN reference architecture, we've recently had good partnerships on DAS, or distributed radio systems. These locations can not only provide connectivity, but also can provide computes. Again, back at the Korean Olympics, Intel with a partner utilized the FlexRAN capability plus mech and allowed people that were attending the Olympics to virtually walk onto the ice arena, providing a whole new experience for those users. In addition to this, we've also partnered with Telefonic and Fivetonic, showcasing how you can use FlexRAN and allowing Fivetonic customers to demo RAN experiences that they expect to happen in the 5G era. Now, we are certainly seeing a ton of traction in the RAN around virtualization, and we expect to see more in the 5G era, and we also do expect traditional integrated base stations to continue to flourish and really complement virtual RAN in 5G. So the network of the future does need, to, does need to deliver both customization and personalization. And one of the key technologies to truly pull this together is something called network slicing. Now, ne what network slicing does is it is simply allows you to create a slice of the network for a specific vertical market application and hit those underlying KPIs and SLAs. At the same time, you run that on top of a horizontal network so you can still meet your TCO 
right, hit while hitting the overall quality of experience. You can see how this could be a critical technology in the era of 5G, where you have a lot of di different diverse use cases, such as IoT, with low bandwidth, as well as low latency in many cases, whereas uh, AR, VR, or cloud gaming may have high bandwidth and low latency. We are such believers in this technology that we're innovating ourselves in our Oregon 5G lab, currently by type of service, by type of radio, and we're working towards dynamic slicing, all of which will be given back to ONAP as part of our open source efforts. Now, Intel does continue to invest in a whole set of new platforms. And just in the last 12 months, we've innovated and we've delivered our Xeon scalable processor family, our Xeon D, and our Atom C3000, all with delivering a top to bottom scalable roadmap with strong architecture consistency. This is along with the additional ingredients we have, such as FPGAs, SSDs, and Ethernet, to complete that edge vision. And the beauty of this roadmap is the architecture consistency. If you think about it, in a central core network, you may want max performance to be able to hit the bandwidth. You'd select a Xeon SP. In other cases, you may need a solution that, that caters to a more power and space constrained environment. And in that case, you may select a Xeon D. The beauty is with architecture consistency, you can truly scale your VNFs as well as your applications throughout your network with great ease and be able to deliver the sort of network that will truly allow you to hit your customers' expectations. And with that, I'm really excited to announce or, or to invite Melissa Evers Hood to the stage. She is our Senior Director of Cloud and Edge Open Source Software at Intel, and she would like to share with you some of our latest innovations. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be here. I am thrilled to be here to announce a couple really exciting things that we have going on. Um, specifically, we intend to um, contribute some very substantial assets into the open source ecosystem with the explicit intent of accelerating edge technology and innovation. Specifically, we are intending to open source our Wind River Titanium Cloud. Uh, for those of you who know Wind River Titanium Cloud, it has a stellar reputation in the industry um, and is in production today with uh, deployments from IoT and Industrial Edge all the way up to carrier grade implementations of Edge technology. This is intended to really accelerate the ecosystem with regard to providing assets that are low latency, provide high availability, the ability to update in the field, et cetera. In addition, we are also open sourcing our Network Edge Virtualization SDK. This set of libraries and APIs enable developers to develop applications for Edge use cases um, without having to understand the complexities of various network protocols. These two assets are tremendously valuable to our company, and we hope they will be tremendously valuable to the ecosystem as well. We believe that they will provide the foundation to coalesce and really get that flywheel go going that Jim spoke about earlier. In addition, I wanted to announce that we are contributing these pro projects under the Acrano project. So we feel that there needs to be one edge stack. There's a lot of projects across the ecosystem and in open source that are dabbling with trying to create um, an edge stack that is hardened and reliable and ready for production. Um, we are announcing with this host of amazing partners that we're standing up and joining Acrano with the intention of making this project the project for edge. Specifically, with regard to Intel's contributions, the Wind River Titanium Cloud has over seven new assets that will be contributed to the project. We, will also, we also have a huge host of patches that add features and capabilities to existing upstream open source projects. So th the likes of Ceph, QEMU, OpenStack, et cetera. And so we will be working very um, aggressively in the communities that these projects are in to try to merge these patches upstream and give the entire community the benefit of this innovation and engineering. 
We are very excited about what this represents for the company, but we recognize that it, we need all of your support. Um, all of us need to work together to contribute to not only stabilizing an edge stack for deployment across the variety of use cases that exist today, from industrial to, um, to carrier, but also what's coming in our future. We all see the dreams and the realities that are um, possible with 5G, and we recognize that while these assets are tremendous, and they should very much accelerate the innovation fly cycle. In the same regard, we know that we have more work to do. We have to be very focused on trying to figure out um, the containerization and future technologies, and we need your support not only in the communities, but also innovating to lead this platform forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a ton, Melissa. It was truly exciting to hear about uh, the Ukraino project as well as Intel's uh, contributions. I do see that as a big part of the overall uh, industry effort to enable uh, edge applications in the future. So Intel's relationship with the Linux Foundation, we believe, is truly essential. It's truly essential to drive the right reference architectures and innovation so we can truly scale our networks in the future. And as platform members, we're quite proud of our contributions. We're quite proud that we partner with the overall industry on a wide variety of projects, ranging from Open Daylight, OPNFV, DBDK, FIDO, ONAP, just to mention a few. And most of our contributions truly center around bringing out the best in the hardware platforms in a very open way, creating the right inter interfaces on top so everyone can, can innovate in a true open fashion. So because of this, we typically do contribute to projects such as DBDK and FIDO. But in addition to this, we also do contribute and support many efforts at the orchestration and controller level as we do see these as vital assets to truly enable the flexibility we've been talking about in this very discussion. Now additionally, we also have something called the Intel Network Builders. Now this is a vibrant community that truly pulls together across ISVs, OSVs, IHVs, and comm service providers to pull together network transformation solutions that have been optimized, tested, and then soon to be deployed. We are quite proud with over 260 members today, and there's over 82 unique solutions. This is truly an exciting time. It's truly a great time to be part of this networking community. I look forward to continuing to partner with everyone in this room, and I look forward to sharing a few moments with, with everyone, perhaps in the hallway or at other LFN events during the week. Thank you very much for your time.